Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know already, if you've, certainly if you've been with us before, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And these are the lessons for the last three months of the year 2013. And it's a series entitled The Sanctuary. This is lesson number eight in that series for November 23 of 2013. And it's entitled Christ Our Priest. If you remember last week, we talked about Christ Our Sacrifice. And now here's the, the other side to that, Christ Our Priest and we'll see what it has to say to us. We hope you have your Bible in hand. If not, we would recommend that you grab it. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we are delighted to recognize your presence as we talk about your word. There are some challenging things in your word, some things that might not be easy for us to understand, and so we ask for the special guidance of your Holy Spirit that what we say and, and speak may be in the best interests of your cause and it may bring light and help to those who are listening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The only unique doctrine Seventh-day Adventists have is our doctrine about the sanctuary. Seventh-day Adventists believe and teach, and obviously I'm really crunching this down into a few words, that the religious calendar of the ancient Jews is a kind of type of the history of sin and salvation on this earth. We believe that we are now living in the antitypical Day of Atonement, which began on October 22 of 1844. Can you explain what you mean by type and anti-type? Let's talk about that for just a moment. By the way, if you'd like some more information about these handouts, they're available on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You probably see that on your screen there. What do I mean by type and anti-type? Um, in the Bible, there are many places where a, an example or, a, or a, um, sometimes it's a living example, sometimes it's just a, a vision that's given to a prophet and something is said or explained and then we realize later that it points forward to something maybe bigger and more important in the future. So this type is in front is the first thing we hear here, and the anti-type is the fulfillment which comes later. So briefly, that would be the difference between a kind type. Of an example and the fulfillment. Yeah, something like that. Now, who was it that said in the Bible, your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary? That would have been David in the Psalms. David. Mm -hmm. So God's way is in the sanctuary. Yeah, and he's trying to teach us something about himself. So this lesson, as we've already mentioned, and it's mentioned in the title, focuses on the heavenly sanctuary and the role of Christ as our high priest. Of course, here's the, there's, there's several very big challenges to that issue. None of us have ever seen the sanctuary in heaven. Have you seen it? None of us have seen it. Well, but so, the Bible talks about it. Okay, but, and that's the point, the only ways we have to learn about the heavenly sanctuary and what Christ might be doing now is by considering what happened here in the earthly sanctuary and say, well, this is, and Hebrews just tells us bluntly that what happened here was only a very faint shadow of what's going on up there. So we can't take that to be the full picture. And two, the description of what, hap what is actually happening in the heavenly sanctuary as presented basically in the book of Hebrews because there's no other places in the Bible that really tries to explain what's happening in the heavenly sanctuary. So we have those two main sources for information. But there's more problems. Um, the, this, this comp, the prop, the, there's a further complication by the fact that Christ, as we suggested last time, was the sacrifice. This week we talk about him as high priest. Were there any priests high priest here on this earth that were both a sacrifice and the high priest? No. Why not? You can't. Human beings can't, can't do this. You have to can't. die in order to be a sacrifice and you can't at the same time be a high priest. So here we have another source of possible confusion. How can Christ be both the sacrifice and the high priest? And there's an additional complication, if we didn't have enough already. The book of Hebrews spends quite a bit of time 
saying that the priesthood of Christ is like the priesthood of Melchizedek. So now you all understand it perfectly well, right? All about Melchizedek. How much do we know about Melchizedek? Isn't he only in a teeny tiny part of the Bible? Well, look at Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20. And Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, by the way, just in passing, notice that Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. That's what the name means. Who is also the king of Salem. What does Salem mean? Peace. Peace. So the king of righteousness and the king of peace. I mean, how would you like a name like that? Mm -hmm. And also a priest of the Most High God brought bread and wine to Abram as he was coming back from that conquest against those other kings. Blessed him and said, May the Most High God who made heaven and earth bless Abram. May the Most High God who gave you victory over your enemies be praised. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the loot that he had recovered. So, now what do we know about Melchizedek? We know his name, location, similar to Jesus' uh, characteristics, and uh, that he was a priest. King and priest. King and priest. Yeah. Well, there's one more thing we know about him, and we're not sure where this information came from, but Psalm 110, right out of the middle of nowhere, David says, The Lord made a solemn promise and will not take it back. You will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Now, is that something God revealed to him? Where did he get that idea? We have no idea. How long did Melchizedek live before David? Oh, David lived about 1,000. Melchizedek lived about 2,000. So th think of somebody who lives a thousand years before you. Okay. Was the order of Melchizedek the fact that he was a king and priest? Well, let's be honest. What do we know about Melchizedek? Just what you read. And the answer is almost nothing. It's very clear that we, we don't know anything about his family. We don't know whether he even had any children. We don't know anything about his wife. We know nothing about his genealogy. We know nothing about what was before him or after him. Okay, he's just there, in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. But we know that Abraham thought he was superior to him. Mm -hmm. He was blessed. He was able to but bless Melchizedek Abraham. Melchizedek was superior to to Abraham, and bec and therefore Abraham did what? Gave him, gave him gifts and tithe. So what is implied by that? We know that Abraham. I mean, I'm sorry. Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem, which in those days was just called Salem. So that was Jerusalem, one of the, the first king that we know about of Jerusalem. Was he a Jew? No, he wasn't. Thank you. <laughs> no, he couldn't be a Jew yes, because no Jews, were Jews were descendants of Judah, whose father was Jacob, whose father was Isaac, whose father was Abraham. So nobody had ever heard of a Jew yes. yet. So there's no genealogy line in the Bible that says so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot Melchizedek? Nothing like that at all. So why, why do we bring his name up? Why does Hebrews talk quite a lot about him? Just one point that I thought about. Um, we've in the past said, well, Abraham went to Palestine as a missionary. Mm -hmm. Well, Melchizedek was there. He was a priest of the Most High God. He was a so a Abraham went to join Melchizedek. Okay. It might have gone there to learn something. Maybe so. Yeah, maybe. At the very least, Melchizedek must have been an outstanding man yeah. to make that kind of a mention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, why, does the Bible, why do you think the Bible calls Jesus a high priest in the order of Melchizedek? Well, there are two reasons that might not be immediately obvious to us, but were pretty obvious to the Jews. One, Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. Now, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah and was of the lineage of David, and that was the kingly line. So he should have been hereditarily, potentially a king, right? But according to Jewish thinking, he was not eligible to be a priest. Which, which were the line of priests? Levi. The, li the line of Levi, and especially from Levi, Aaron, and especially Mo Moses and Aaron, but especially the descendants of Aaron. They were the high priestly family. 
Okay? So Jesus, according to Jewish thinking, would have no eligibility to be a priest. So by saying that Jesus is in the line of Melchizedek, you're saying he could be a king and a priest. Two, since Abraham offered to pay tithe to Melchizedek, the implication is that he was prior to and perhaps even superior to either Levi or Aaron. Why? Well, look at these words in Hebrews 7, 4 to 10. You see then how great he was. Abraham, our famous ancestor, gave him a tenth of all he got in the battle. And those descendants of Levi who are priests are commanded by the law to collect a tenth from the people of Israel. That is, from their own people, even though they are also descendants of Abraham. Melchizedek was not descended from Levi, but he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him, the man who received God's promises. There is no doubt that the one who blesses is greater than the one who is blessed. And in the case of the priests, the tenth is collected by men who die. But as for Melchizedek, the tenth was collected by one who lives, as the scripture says, and so to speak, when Abraham paid the tenth, Levi, whose descendants collect the tenth, also paid it. For Levi had not yet been born, but was, so to speak, in the body of his ancestor Abraham when Melchizedek met him. So you see the logic here. What's going on? The author of Hebrews is saying, don't try to tell me that Jesus is not eligible to be king and priest because here's somebody superior to your Aaron, superior to Levi, and he was what? King and priest. So let's call Jesus according to the line of Melchizedek. And if you admit that he could... Now, this is not to say that Jesus was somehow physically descended from Melchizedek. He's just saying he belongs to that line of people who are both king and priest. Of course, we as Christians recognize that Christ is, as our high priest, is a better order than either Aaron or Melchizedek. Jesus never sinned. He was fully obedient to the law, and thus he did not need to bring any offering on his own behalf. Thus, he could be the perfect offering as well as a high priest after his resurrection. So, now, well, let's get down to the priestly stuff. What does the priest do? Handles the sacrifice. Especially the high priest? Handles. He speaks on behalf of the people, right? And he, he does things on behalf of the people. Isn't that his role? I mean, why do they pay him? Why do they give him their tithe? He's representative for them, between them. And that's what they asked for, wasn't it? Back in, remember Exodus 20, verses 18 to 20? Please, Moses, you stand between us and God because we're afraid that if he speaks to us again, what's going to happen? We're going to die. So they asked for that. So now, as high priest, if Jesus is speaking for us, and that's very clear in Romans 8. Who's speaking against us? Well, look at these passages very quickly. We don't have time to read the whole of last half of Romans 8, but look at Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us and groans that words cannot express. And then if we drop down to verse... Um, 31, in view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, and that's talking about the Father, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own Son, so that's the evidence that's talking about the Father, but offered him for us all. He gave us his Son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right-hand side of God, pleading with him for us. So we have all three members of the Godhead are on whose side? Our, Our side. side. So who is accusing us? Satan. Look at, you know, the, the famous passage, of course, is? Zechariah 5, Zechariah 3. Revelation 12 and Zechariah 3. Let's look at Revelation 12 first. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. 
Now his Messiah has shown his authority for the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. And who was thrown out of heaven? Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed. And they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there, but how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you and he is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. So who's accusing us, according to Revelation 12? Satan. And if we go back to Zechariah 3, real quickly, in another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. So, clearly, who's on what side? Satan is accusing us, and all three members of the Godhead are for us. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does Satan's angels accuse us, the demons? Do if they, they get a chance us? to. Okay, they try to play havoc in our lives, and they also are among the accusers. Mm -hmm. okay. How do you feel about the idea that when your case comes up in heaven, the Satan's going to be there to accuse you? Pretty scary, huh? Hope he has memory problems. <laughs> Hope he's got memory problems. Well, but remember who's on our side? All three members of the Godhead are on our side. Maybe that's why you should discuss your sins with God beforehand so he... Yeah, all of it has been aired out before, and it, mm. it doesn't, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and look at the last few verses of Romans 8. I mean, God's love is so immense that nothing, 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 high heavens, low hell, wherever you go, nothing can separate us from it. That is God's love, except our own choice. When the, when the adversary or the accuser brings that up, He's still trying to impugn God's ju nature and God's judgment. That's what that's again. He already knows what we're like, but he's trying to, to the rest of the universe, say, say look at this, God's not fair. He, in fact, Satan is the one that uh, argues about fairness. Now, how is Satan trying to impugn God's character by our sins? Like, well, well, God's not fair. Yeah, look what, what he's done to Satan. He's cast him out of heaven. And uh, he should, the rest of us should stay out of heaven. There, there are two things, and we're going to get to some verses about that a little bit later. But there's two things here. One, Satan says, oh, so these are your people, God? Look what they're doing. So what is he really saying? God, you can't judge character. Yeah, you can't judge character. You're, you, you know, these people are obviously sinners. They're supposed to be on my side. They are supposed to belong to me. How can you claim them? Yeah. That's one thing. And then on the other side, He's, he's saying, he, he's saying, through us that God. He's actually directly accusing God, because you know clearly God, you can't tell the truth about these people. But we're gonna, we're gonna. There's even another point we're gonna make a little bit later in the lesson. So, look at First John two one. There's a very interesting verse there. I'm writing this to you, my children, so that you will not sin. So what's the purpose? To get us to stop sinning. So stop sinning. Why are you sinning? But if anyone does sin, he goes on, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Okay? Someone who pleads to the Father on our behalf. Do you know what that is? There's a word, the word for the word, Greek word there is parakletos. Is that the word for plead? <laughs> That's the word for someone who comes alongside, who's a counselor or a helper. Yeah. A parakletos was a person who came to the aid of another person in war or in various other settings. Also, we need to notify that the Holy Spirit is called a parakletos. Look at John 14, 26, for example, one, one place. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember all that I have told you. So, and if we had time, we would also read chapter 15, 26, and chapter 16, 7, and other places, saying that the helper who, there's two helpers here that have said that their work is to come to our aid if we have any problems at all. There's Jesus, and there's the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm a little bit confused. Before you said Jesus pleads for us, mm -hmm. and you're saying the word is actually this 
Paracalus. Well, no. And it means the, he comes uh, aside of us mm -hmm. and So helps. the person who stands beside us to help us may plead for us. What he's doing okay. also in that process is a, a, a continuing at one process, trying to convince us, giving us evidence and giving us strength. That's it. So many people have the idea, oh, Jesus paid the penalty at the cross, that's the atonement, and that's it. Rather than a continuing atonement, that, that's uh, the... Uh, so uh, is Jesus coming up alongside us and giving us half the yoke and he's carrying half the yoke? Is that where that that's comes That's Matthew in? 11, 28 to 30, yes. But is that what that word means, or is, does it mean like, let's say you go in court and someone stand and speak for you and defend you? Well, in and the Greek, comforter. in the original Greek, mm -hmm. a parakletos was someone who, there were, there were assistants who stood at the back when the, when the military was going to war. And if someone would fall, this person would rush up to see if there was anything to do to help them. That's, that's really what that's all about. So. So what does the pleading of Christ consist of, if he's our high priest? Is he there only to answer the accusations of Satan? But when Jesus stepped down to take the role of Michael, the archangel, among the angels, was he being a mediator to the angels? Yes. That was before sin entered our universe, right? So apparently there's reason to be a mediator even apart from sin. So Jesus was moving among his creation, the angels, just like he came and he moved among this earth. Mm -hmm. Now look at this verse, Hebrews 7, 25. And so he is able now and always to save those who come to God through him because he lives forever to plead with God for them. Now, if the only purpose of Jesus' pleading is to somehow get us past the Father's wrath, does that mean God's going to be angry with us forever? I certainly hope not. He never was and never will be. He never was and never will be. So, Jesus is going to continue to be our high priest forever. So, we have to have a role, if we're going to talk about what this high priest is actually doing, we have to have some kind of a role for him that last forever, right? You mean even in heaven he's going to be Even our? in heaven. After sin is done and gone, why would Christ need to be a mediator? Will he continue to teach us about God for the rest of eternity? Sure. Sure. Wouldn't that be a teacher instead of a mediator? Why is he called a mediator? Well, he's conveying knowledge and information to the, the well, finite beings. Yeah. Let me ask another question. We have often suggested, and we've said this many times, that God reaches us where we are and speaks a language we can understand, don't we? Mm -hmm. We've said that many times. At this point in time, do we need a translator? Because we're not very good at understand God's, understanding God's language. So maybe the mediator is really a translator. What some people would like for you to do, yeah, I know I went to some churches, yeah. and I would read and get something out, and they would say, no, this is what it means. And I got to think, and I couldn't trust my own eyes mm -hmm. because what I saw. So they wanted to... Um, Impose their meaning on it. Yeah. I see. Well, we've already suggested, we talked about a little about this last week, that Christ deals with our sins, Romans 8, 3. But it looks like he's also dealing with the root of our sin, which is our selfishness and rebellion. And when he offers us salvation, what does salvation mean? Not just forgiveness and some kind of legal transaction. The word literally in Greek, the same word for salvation is healing. So we come back to our basic question. In what sense does Christ stand in our place or in our stead in heaven? You mean right now? Right now. Or even, we're, we've got to extend this. He was doing this before sin came into the universe. He was apparently going to continue doing this forever. What's he going to do? Gordon? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to forever try and show us what the Father is like. Okay. Because our understanding will be incomplete 
will get closer and closer, but it won't won't get there. And he will be forever our teacher, as you said, our tran the translator, our mediator. Well, let's let's look at some possibilities. I was going to say you can see it in our present condition, but yeah. if we make it to heaven, and hopefully we will, it's almost like don't we ever graduate? Yeah. In the eons of time, yeah. it, 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 you, it's something we're going to have to wait till we get there. Yeah. Almost. Well, let's be very clear on one thing. Does God the Father love us? Yes. yes. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son. I mean, do we, I mean, what kind of a gift is that? And look at John 16.25 to 27. I have used figures, this is Jesus talking to his disciples on his last night with them. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. So is God... The Father does what? So is Jesus pleading for us? Or is he... Or is both he and the Father pleading or interceding for us? We already said all three of the God, members of the Godhead are on our side, right? right. So, yeah. Okay, so we know who's against us. And if Jesus is pleading for us, he's pleading in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, in cooperation with the Father. So it's three members of the Godhead, here we are in the middle, Satan is accusing us over here. So it's three against one. Is that fair? And all we have to do is <laughs> say yes. All we have to do is say yes. To whichever one we want to say yes yeah. to. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. This gives us a little more insight. It's talking about pleasing God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. What does God want? Re let me read on. For there is one God, and there is one who brings, human, brings God and human beings together, the man, Christ Jesus. So, Previously, he's talking about Jesus, or he's talking about the Father? He says he's bringing together God and human beings, and the one who brings them together is Christ Jesus. It doesn't sound like he's talking about Jesus, does it? Who gave himself, Jesus who gave himself to redeem everyone. That was the proof at the right time that God wants everyone to be saved. I mean, how can it be any clearer than that? People, some people don't think that they are among everyone. Okay. Well, if we are to come to a knowledge of the truth, does that require education? Yes. I would think so. Now we're back to it, the educator, aren't we? Well, several words are used to describe the role of a mediator in Scripture. There's mediator, there's intercessor, there's intermediary, Sometimes even in some of the more modern translations, go between. Notice these words from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. The popular understanding of an intercessor is of one who is a go-between for two antagonistic parties. This model of two opposed sides and a mediator or intercessor coming between them and trying to reconcile them by changing their mutual hatred misunderstanding, prejudices, feelings, and attitudes toward each other lies at the heart of this misunderstanding. The implications of such an understanding of Christ's mediation are quite devastating. This is in our Bible study guide. The Lord is seen as an angry God who has to be begged, bended, and changed in his attitude toward human beings in order to give them grace and grant them mercy. What a horrible picture of God! This distortion of God's character has terrible consequences in popular Christian thinking. Jesus is not, a po is not powerful enough to intercede. He needs help. Thus, Mary is pleading with God, in addition, Peter, Paul, and the apostles, plus, an, plus all international, national, and local saints. In this way, God is depicted as a monster, an angry deity who is not easy to appease, but the biblical model of intercession is a completely different. Wow. Is when was the last time you read something like that in the Bible study guide? Is there anything better than that to describe it? Yeah. What about that? 
In a discussion about finding treasures hidden in the field, Ellen White made this comment about the treasures of truth that we need to search for and find. As you find them, what then? Why, are, why you find that there is truth, beautiful truth, jewels of truth, riches of truth, and you accept them. What do they do? They bind you by the gospel links to the eternal God. For Jesus Christ came that he might link finite man with the infinite God and connect earth that has been divorced by sin and transgressions from heaven. What riches, what treasures, what love are here revealed. It is impossible, yes, it is impossible to conceive of the love of God that is bestowed upon fallen humanity. Ellen G. White, Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, page 253, paragraph 1, and she's there, I'm sure, thinking about those last few verses in Romans 8. Talks about it's impossible to, uh, you know, to, to say too much about God's love or think it's too big. Okay, so now let's see if we can start coming to some conclusions. In light of what we have said so far, try to picture what you think is going on in the heavenly sanctuary in the heavenly courtroom right now. It may be helpful to review Daniel 7, 9, and 10. Why would I say that? Here's what Daniel saw. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever, who would that be? God. Sat down on one of the thrones. Now, why is he sitting on this throne? His clothes were, clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. Is that a clear picture of a courtroom seat, uh, session? Yes. Sounds like it, doesn't it? And what's happening in this courtroom? Judgment. How many people are present? Millions. 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 Millions of beings. Millions of beings. Satan is continually making accusations against God's people and against God himself. We need to recognize that the scriptures make it clear that when Satan attacks God's people, God regards that as a direct attack against himself. And there's some beautiful verses. Look at these verses. Zechariah 2, verse 8. Anyone who strikes you strikes what is most precious to me. And you know in the King James it says, he hits the apple of my eye, right? Mm -hmm. The apple of my eye. That would be the pupil, I assume. Mm -hmm. Look at Matthew 25, verses 40 and 45. The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least of the important of these members of my family, you did it for me. So in verse 45, he says the same thing again. What is he saying? Look at Acts 9, 4-5. Four four this is Paul when he was struck by that beam of light from heaven and he falls to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Was Paul persecuting Jesus? His followers, which is he was same. following his, mm -hmm. he was persecuting the followers of Jesus. And so God says that's the same as doing what? Persecuting me. So God thinks of us as if we are a part of him. Look at Luke 10, verse 16. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. I mean, I don't know how many more, how more convincing arguments we could possibly make than that. What additional requirements has Christ fulfilled in order to be a true high priest for us? What does a high priest have to do? Well, we said he doesn't need to spend his time convincing the Father to love us. We know that already. So what does he need to do? Well, look at Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. This means that he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way in order to be their faithful and merciful high priest in his service to God so that the people's sins would be forgiven. And now he can help those who are tempted because he himself was tempted and suffered. So, does that mean that Jesus needed to come down from heaven because he didn't really understand us? He didn't know all the tough trouble, the tough times we were going through. He didn't know like what, what it was like to be tempted. So now he's been down here. 
Now he's been tempted, so now he can go back to heaven. He can say, Father, I realize that you think they ought to be better than they are, but you don't know how tough it is to be tempted down in that world. But I went there, and I know how tough it is, so let me tell you, please, Father, please, I plead my blood. No. No. It doesn't mean that? No. <laughs> I've heard that kind of thing said a lot of times. But look, but Jesus actually was here, as uh, as it says in John, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It was mm -hmm. so that we could see God. We can see God, okay? And how Jesus treated sinners, Mary Magdalene, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Christ, now I'm looking at another verse, Hebrews three, verse six. Verse six. But Christ is faithful as the Son in charge of God's house. We are his house if we keep up our courage and our confidence in the hope and what we hope for. So what is, how does Christ want to regard us? He is the keeper of the house and we are the house. Look at another place. Same book, Hebrews, now chapter 4, starting with verse 14. Let us then hold firmly to the law, to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who is tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will, there we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. Now, is that grace available only because Jesus is there? Please, Please. The Let's, Father himself loves him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then Hebrews 7. i got to read a couple more verses. But Jesus lives forever. This is Hebrews 7, verse 24. But Jesus lives on forever, and his work as priest does not pass on to someone else. And so he's able, we read this verse earlier, now and always to save those who come to God through him because he lives forever to plead with God for them. Jesus then is the high priest who, that meets their needs. He is holy. He has no fault or sin in him. He has been set apart from sinners and raised above the heavens. Now, is this saying when we get to heaven, Jesus will be guiding us still? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. He's, he's supposedly pleading for us, whatever that involves. We've suggested that it might involve education. It mo might involve getting us to, to meet together with the Father so we come to understand Him better. All of that. So, why was it important for Jesus to come and live His life on this earth in order to be a mediator for us? That was supposed to be an easy question. <laughs> so we can see God in a practical sense. Yeah. So He can understand us. Could we, do we have the opportunity of going to heaven and spending a little while there and learning about God? No. So what happens? He came to live he here. Came here. He came to us. How do we get to know him? He came here. Study his life. Was there anything about us that he didn't understand before he came? No. 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 Otherwise, you're, 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 you're questioning the wisdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. Or was his coming to this earth exclusively for our benefit so that we can come to understand something about him? Ellen White quite often spoke of Christ as our substitute and surety. What's a surety? It's kind of like, like insurance. Bond. Yeah, insurance or a bond. If you're in trouble, you go to the bondsman. Okay, a surety in, in a simple sense is, suppose you and I decide we're going we're gonna, to, I have a company and you have a company and we're going to put these two companies together and we're going to, we're going to work together, cooperate in some kind of a new arrangement. And we put up a lot of money for it. So a surety would be, okay, we're going to go to someone and maybe we jointly pay some money and we're going to, we're going to pay an insurance company to guarantee that we're not going to lose a whole lot of money on this deal. So that if something goes wrong that we didn't expect, then that insurance covers us. So what do we mean when we say that Jesus is our surety? How much have we paid for the benefits of Jesus to coming to this earth? Nothing. What did it cost you? Nothing. What did I pay? Nothing. What did any of us pay? 
Nothing. Mm -hmm. So God's paid everything. And what does he put on the table to pay for it? His son. The, de the life and death of his son. Well, we have noted very clearly in previous lessons that one of the main purposes of the earthly sanctuary services was to point out that sin leads to what? Death. 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 Maybe we ought to say that several times. Sin leads to yeah. death. And that was the purpose of the earthly sanctuary service. Yes. In the larger context of the great controversy and the salvation of human beings, it required the death of Jesus himself. And why is that? Well, here's an interesting verse, interesting set of verses that we're hopefully very familiar with. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God. And where are you reading from? This is Philippians 2, starting from verse 5. Philippians 2, starting from verse 5. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, what did he do? Now, we have sometimes added, the first step down was what? To be Michael the archangel, right? And then the next step down is what? Here. To become a human being. So instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. Did, how, how much did he become like a human being? He was born as a baby. He lives in his entire life as a human being. Can anyone, could anyone say, well, no, you, you don't really understand us. You haven't been through what we've been through. What kind of a city, what kind of a town did he live in? Disreputable. It was notorious for its evil, right? And we don't know for sure, but it's very likely. It, this, this town of Nazareth was very close to Sephoris, which was the... Roman fortress, a Roman area that was building up a city being built by the Romans. You know, and there were all Roman soldiers and so forth living there. What kind of influence would that be? You can imagine a bunch of soldiers out there. Yeah. So, he was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, what's the result? What's What's the final conclusion? And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So how does he accomplish that? Is, that? is that by spilling a few drops of blood? Education. Education. Education about what? The truth about God. Now, when it says all will drop on their knees, does that mean creation also? Because what are the fish going to do? And I mean, does that mean? Well, that? the most important thing it means to me is that even the devil will be down on his knees. Mm -hmm. And saying, you are right. You, God, you are right. And that you are love. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you did everything for these people. In fact, you did every, everything for even... God did everything he possibly could, even for the devil himself. Mm -hmm. okay. But the devil would never say yes to God. No. Mm -hmm. But now he's... The, the panorama that we're going to see at the end of time that tells the whole story of the, the sin conflict, the great controversy, all the way through history, is going to be so compelling that nobody will be able to resist it. Everyone will be down on their knees saying... Yes, God, you did everything you possibly could have done. And okay. yet many people walk away. And a lot of people walk away. While there are lessons we can learn from the earthly sanctuary and its services, let us remember what it says in the first few verses of Hebrews 10. The Jewish law, the Jewish Old Testament, is not, notice that word, not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year, and so forth that goes on. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who come to God? And then it goes down to verse 4. For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. So what do we learn from that? Whatever we can conclude from the old 
system there that was out in the desert, or even Solomon's temple, or even Herod's temple, is not the whole story, right? Mm. Uh, those ancient ceremonies simply point to the solution. They aren't the solution, they point to the solution, which is the death of Jesus and his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. While the earthly sanctuary required the offering of animal sacrifices morning and evening, and often many times in a day, the fact that the death of Jesus was a once-for-all offering is demonstrated by the fact that the temple curtain between the holy place and the most holy place was ripped from top to bottom at the time when Jesus died. What is, what, what's, what is God trying to say to us by that Who did action? the ripping? Who do you think did the ripping? It was, it was 30 feet high. Any human being could do it. This was a big, heavy tapestry. Uh -huh. You think any human being could do that? No. By the way, the references for that are Matthew 27, 51 and Mark 5, uh, pardon me, Mark 15, 38. Very good. So now we are totally dependent upon the once-for-all sacrifice that Christ made. None of us is still offering animal sacrifices. I'm pretty sure of that. Any of you offered an animal sacrifice? No. So is the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf adequate? Yes. Going back just a sentence. Okay. Uh, the Jews don't offer sacrifices now because Jerusalem is not in their hands and that was no, the only Jerusalem place. Jerusalem is in their hands except, well, except the place where they offer except sacrifices. Except the Dome of the Rock, well, the, the, is Mount Moriah where this temple was supposed to be or used to be and where the sacrifices are supposed to be offered. So they would tell the you... the one and only place that sacrifices were to be offered? That's what they were told in the Old Testament. I went up to a young man who was wearing a Jewish cap. Um, he looked friendly, and I said, um, "What you know?" I wanted to ask you. I'm, I'm curious. What do you do now that you cannot sacrifice, mm -hmm. or that you do not sacrifice animals? And he says, "We pray on the sacrifices that were made in the past." Oh, that was his answer. Mm -hmm. Well, here's uh, an interesting comment from Ellen White. Selected Messages, Book 2, pages 32 and 33. The conscience can be freed from condemnation. Through faith in his blood, all may be made perfect in Christ Jesus. Thank God that we are not dealing with impossibilities. We may claim sanctification. We may enjoy the favor of God. We are not to be anxious about what, God, what Christ and God think of us, but about what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. Boy, what is that, what's that saying to us? Wow. Now, if God, every time God looks at a sinner, he sees Christ, why isn't everybody savable? Aren't we all sinners? Is God going to always see us as Christ if we just go on sinning and say, aha, we have Christ's robes, so we can do what we want because it's going to cover up everything that we do. Uh, there are a lot of people who claim that. We still have free choice. We still have the choice to walk away from God, mm -hmm. even though he's given us every opportunity. So we know what, God, what the Father thinks of Christ, don't we? Yes. So what she's really trying to say here is, he can think the same thing of us if we're willing to comply. In other words, we're going to be future daughters and sons of God. Okay. Right? He, he, in, in a number of places, he suggests, that he, he suggests that he is the elder brother among, in a, a large family. And we're all supposed to be members of that family, right? Well, in light of what we've studied so far in this series of the, on the sanctuary, are you fully convinced that there is no reason to be afraid of God? Are you convinced that the Father loves us just as much as the Son? As some Christians believe, do you wonder if perhaps we might need Mary or, or the apostles or other saints to be pleading for us in, the, in addition to Christ? I had one lady tell me, but Mary understands me and God really doesn't because Mary's a woman. Mm -hmm. And I thought, isn't that strange? God created us. Yeah. He understands us. Yeah. And how do we know God isn't a woman? Hear, hear. 
<laughs> no, I'm just playing. He's, he's I'm just everything. Playing. Yeah. He, we have no proof that he's a male. The only reason he's presented in male terms in the Bible is because they, the males were the leaders in society at that point in time. And I can tell you, I've said this before, I don't know if I've said it in this group, but about half of the names for God in the Old Testament, they had a, a language where the names could be either male or female, about half of the names for God in the Old Testament are female. I don't know exactly what the ratio is, but there's a lot of female names for God in the Old Testament. So well, God made us after his image, or yeah. after their image, and he made us yep. male and female, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, do you feel more comfortable with the whole heavenly court scene when you recognize that Jesus has been, become permanently a human being to, to identify himself with us? So even though we have all three members of the Godhead on our side, there's one standing beside us that actually looks like a human being. Does that make us more comfortable? Wait, are you suggesting Jesus still look like, as a human? He maintaining this? Well, he, at least he's enough like a human being so there can only be in one place at a, one time. He doesn't. He says he can't be everywhere at once anymore. I don't think I, a court scene is ever comfortable. Even you know, you've you've always got that tinge of something could go wrong. But uh, so you have to just put all your faith in Jesus and realize. He is as strong as anything. It won't go wrong in God's court. Yeah. That's in human courts where it goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, none of us still believe that the Father is angry with us and that Christ somehow needs to appease his wrath. So, does Christ's intercession in the heavenly sanctuary include some aspect of his helping us in our daily troubles on this earth? I hope so. So, in addition to pleading for us up there, he has time to help us down here? What about the Holy Spirit? Now, he can be everywhere. What did Jesus specifically say about the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. I will send what? Comforter. A comforter, a helper. Mm -hmm. So, if the Holy Spirit is pleading for us up there, and he's our comforter and helper down here, doesn't that mean we can, we can have help? Jesus has to help his people get up out of a mud puddle and walk. Otherwise, he's got a group of people just laying in mud puddles, forgiven, yeah. but laying in mud puddles. Well, what do you think of the following quotation from Philip Yancey? And the, question, and the questions, this, this is in our adult teacher's guide. Uh, if you don't get the teacher's quarterly, you won't get all this. Would it not have been better if the ascension had never happened? If Jesus had stayed on earth, he could answer our questions, he could solve our doubts, he could mediate our disputes of doctrine and policy. By ascending, Jesus took the risk of being forgotten. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better for him to still be here? No. It would be nice to invite him to be a participant at our table and... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Who else would insist on being here too then? Yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. Satan? Mm -hmm. Nothing about getting rid of Satan. <laughs> well, we would put a muzzle on his mouth and not let him talk. <laughs> yeah, just try. Why hasn't somebody done that already? <laughs> Do we really understand why we need a, a, an intercessor and an advocate? We, we have to read these verses. These are very familiar, but this is what it's all about. Our message, this is 2 Corinthians 5, I'm reading verses 19 through 21. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. So what's Christ accomplishing? God did not keep an account of their sins and he has given us the message which tells us how he makes them his friends. Here we are then speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. In other words, if Christ were here, what would he be doing? Same thing, right? He's pleading, let God change you from enemies into his friends. That's what Christ was pleading is all about, right? Isn't that what it says? Once again, we need to remember what it says in John 16, 26 and 27a. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. We need to be reconciled to God. God does not need to be reconciled to us. Have we as Adventists 
always been careful to picture Satan in the scene of the heavenly sanctuary, accusing us instead of suggesting that the Father is somehow accusing us? Do we need to review the nature of God's wrath? Romans 1, 18, 24, 26, 28, 425, and Matthew 27, 46, and Hosea 11, 7 to 9, if you get a chance to get the handout. And what do all those verses say to us? They say, as maybe summarized by, by Hosea 4, 7, I'm sorry, 4, 17, you know, when they're sinning, finally, God finally says, there's nothing more I can do for you. I let you go. Romans 1 tells us that God, God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. And what did Jesus say when he was given up on the cross? My God, my God, why are you torturing me? Why are you beating up me? Why are you burning me in hell? <coughs> no, why have you forsaken me? And Hosea 11, 7 and 9 gives us a clue as to how God feels about all this. Look at that real quick. Hosea 11, 7 and 9. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the oak that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? And Adma, Adma and Zeboim were two small towns just outside of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed along with them. My heart will not, this is God crying, my heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again, for I am God and not a human being. I, the Holy One, am with you. I will, no I will not come to you in anger, speaking in human terms. So how does it make you feel to realize that according to John 17, 20 and 21, right now Jesus is pleading for you in the heavenly sanctuary? Could we ask for any more help than that? Jesus right now is pleading for us as human beings. And when did he start that? October 22, 1844, the doctrine of the sanctuary. And how long is that going to continue? Until he comes again. And he's up there. There's nothing he can't do for us if we're willing to let him. All we have to do is agree to cooperate and God says, that's the only signal I need, that's the only answer I need, welcome. Mm -hmm. See you next week.